I serve. I serve as the Chief Quality Officer at Stanford Children's Health and have the privilege to also serve as the Co-Executive Director of the Stanford Medicine Center for Improvement. Uh, welcome to the SMCI Lecture Series. We are super pleased today uh, to present our speaker, uh, David Schenker. Uh, and David will be speaking to us on machine learning, optimization, and simulation to improve the quality and reduce the cost of care. Um, David is an associate professor uh, in the Department of Pediatrics, as well as the executive director of system designs and collaborative research at Stanford Children's Health. Um, he is the founder and uh, co-director of SURF, which is a collaborative program between the School of Engineering, where engineering students get paired up with either operational or quality and safety leaders uh, at Packard or throughout Stanford Medicine to uh, use advanced data analytics to uh, drive uh, improvement projects. And there have been uh, many great um, projects that have come out of that program. Um, David uh, has a PhD in math that he received from the University of California, San Diego. And then he did a joint research fellowship at MIT and Mass General. Uh, before joining us here uh, at Stanford. And uh, it's a great privilege. I get the uh, privilege of uh, working closely with David and it's uh, always a joy. So David, thank you so much for agreeing to speak to us today and welcome. Thank you for having me and thank you for the generous introduction. It's an honor to speak here. And the many variety of titles I have, I think is a natural byproduct of how interdisciplinary and how collaborative this work is and how many different skill sets it requires. So Lane, I'm gonna to aim to speak for about 25 minutes and then have 25 minutes for discussion. So I'll That's great. launch right in. Uh, my disclosure is that I advise Carta Healthcare, a company actually started by some students based in part on a project they completed with us here at Packard. And this is an overview of Stanford Medicine where we have people kind of really directly involved. We have executive and clinical partners from Packard. And then we have many faculty PhD and master's students from the School of Engineering. You can see a lot more at our website. And we work on many, many projects all over the different facets of patient care, primarily at the Children's Hospital, occasionally Adult Hospital. And I'll just talk about a few of them highlighted here in green within the broader context of how we use these tools and how we try to produce value. The three parts of the talk are gonna be challenges in hospital improvement, keys to success, and then I'll try to illustrate these more general things with a few project examples. Uh, Dr. Andy Shin, someone who Lane and I both work closely with a lot, likes to say healthcare is an old profession, but a young industry. The photo here is necessarily grainy. It's from, you know, about a century ago, and both the patient and the doctor are smoking at the bedside. And the photo on the right, while, you know, it's in a much more modern facility, neither a doctor is smoking, what the doctor, neither the doctor nor the patient is smoking. And there's a variety of ways in which it's been updated. The fundamental care model is the same. It's a physician at the bedside of a patient. And I like to contrast this with how other industries view the current revolution. People like to say data are the new electricity. And they usually say this when they want to use the industrial revolution as a metaphor for what's happening now. And in the industrial revolution, you had factories like this textile factory with these big metal rods running along the ceiling that power the machines and are attached to steam engines outside the building. Initially, they were replaced with an electric engine powering them instead of a steam engine. But the entire production process remained exactly the same. There was less smoke, fewer fires. There were definitely some benefits to replacing a steam engine with an electric engine, but it was not the transformative improvement in quality and productivity that we think of associated with the Industrial Revolution. That came with 
the production of the Ford in a model that totally redesigned the production efforts around the goal of the system to create the car and used electricity to eliminate other barriers or workarounds for how to use machinery or technology to support that goal production and just designed everything to facilitate the goal. So that's the metaphor I like to use. And I wanna mention that at a high level, successful companies match supply and demand. Although these companies are in three totally different industries, their fundamental value add is to do something that others have been doing for a really long time, but to develop the entire infrastructure and value add process using data in ways that make it more efficient, that reduce the waste, that improve the utilization. Now, I think that the opportunity for hospitals for this kind of improvement is ripe. I like to say that the type of medicine we provide here, and I am being generous to myself when I say we, since I have no clinical training at all, but it's like Star Trek. This uh, unifocalization surgery that we perform on the hearts of children that come here from all over the world to receive it, it's absolutely incredible. The technological sophistication associated with imaging ahead of time, diagnosing, preparing, and then actually executing the surgery as well as the recovery in the CBICU, it's absolutely cutting edge technology on par with things that NASA does in terms of the technology deployed and the organization of the teams to deliver it. However, a lot of the operational tools around making it possible are not Star Trek. In particular, when I talked to one of my good friends that's a surgeon and asked him how, when he's busy in clinic, he estimates how long a surgical procedure will take, he sent me back a text message of this picture of Indiana Jones, just kind of guesstimating how long this golden head weighs. And if you remember the movie, he didn't get it exactly right. And there was a frantic chase afterwards. Uh, in the middle is something that's called the Bible. It's a paper book used to schedule a lot of our surgeries. And on the right is a magnet board, which is actually a fantastic innovation at our hospital to try to level load the arrivals of patients to post-surgical units with the magnets and the little stickers and people arrange them to try to prevent bottlenecks. And it, it helps but it's certainly not on par with the technical sophistication of the clinical care we're giving. So in this kind of setting where we think of the challenges as this new availability of data, but we don't quite yet have the infrastructure to deploy the possible machine learning, artificial intelligence optimization and other models that we hear about other industries using, you know, how can we still use data to improve? And so uh, the next part of the talk is a few kind of high level keys to success. Uh, so the first one is we try to think about our projects and how they'll intersect each component of the quadruple aim. The triple aim uh, was very well received. It said projects should focus on patient experience, population health and economic feasibility, and then the quadruple aim was an extension of this to really focus explicitly on provider experience. You can't ask people to click more, look at another screen, open another piece of software, learn another algorithm without adding to the burden, adding to burnout, adding to the problems that a lot of technology that's just taken time and energy away from doctors, nurses, and other care providers and hasn't given them benefit. So we wanna make sure that our projects in the context of whatever problem or opportunity we're focusing on have a clear impact or at least no, do no harm in each of these four areas. And similarly, we wanna to try to simulate, or as uh, Joe Olson, um, Director of Care Ops Services, like to say, if we're gonna fail, let's fail on paper. So this is just a, visual illustration of one year of patient flow 
through the different departments at LPCH grouped together, for example, the acute care units, the CBICU, the PICU, the different procedural units and so on. And while the visual simulation isn't what we use, it I think does illustrate the idea that before we do something, we want to have a sophisticated enough understanding of what's happening in the hospital that we can try to simulate the impact of the changes that we will eventually make. And even if the simulation doesn't end up being particularly beneficial to the design of the model, first building a simulation makes you learn enough about the data, the context, the things that are important to stakeholders that you know what you're doing. And second, it's going to facilitate evaluating in a computer in a cheap way, any kind of intervention before you try to marshal expensive limited institutional resources. Um, uh, this was my first time using a video in the presentation. I have to, okay, here we go. And so I believe the key to success is don't fail. So in particular, you know, while single institution or single department or single condition studies may lack generalizability if they succeed, I think if they fail, a lot of the reasons why things fail are very generalizable. And so there are several ways to fail that in each project we try to avoid in the hopes that if we avoid these common points of failure, then we can get to what we consider success, which is sustained value and that's something that we can measure. So in particular, if physicians, administrators, information services or others do not engage, your project is going to fail at the outset. Then if your technical solution does not achieve necessary performance, if your optimizations, machine learning, whatever, can't solve the problem that needs to be solved. This is not something that happens as commonly because there's so many opportunities that haven't had any sophisticated analytics that the type of analytics we have usually can provide improvement, it does happen. However, if what you produce works, but it's too technically complex or disruptive of workflows or doesn't fit into the infrastructure and the priorities of the system, it won't be implemented. If it is implemented, but it's too difficult to maintain or insufficiently incentivized, it's not gonna to lead to sustained use. And finally, even if you avoid all of these failures, there are a lot of things that get implemented, used, but you can't measure the value that's delivered. Now, if we, have something implemented and the institution is using it and people believe it derives value, that's fantastic. That's more than good enough for us. However, if you can't measure the impact of what you did, it's hard to contribute to this continuously learning, continuously improving system since you don't know if the effort you invested was worth it or not. So really, if you avoid all of these methods of failure and you can measure the value you provided, that's kind of our hope and our goal. And now after these high level aspirational descriptions or best practices or ideas, I'll actually get in and talk about a few projects to illustrate some of the things we've done using this methodology. Now, I know that the format is supposed to be presentation and then discussion. But I think that if somebody has a pressing question and if the organizers uh, don't object strenuously, then I'm happy for you to also ask questions as I present either in the chat or however uh, the organizers would like you to do. So the yeah, first project- we'll, we'll keep track of uh, if any questions come into the chat and either stop if it makes sense to do so there or, or bring them up at the end as well. Perfect, thanks, Lane. So the first project I'll give an example of is to facilitate personalized, efficient chronic disease management. So at a high level, chronic disease management 
often has the patient interacting with the care providers on some fixed cadence. For example, for type one diabetes, there are four annual visits where the patient's HbA1c, a long-term measure of glucose control is measured with a lab and patients are given some feedback. And um, heart disease, there's a different cadence, but they're also you know, scheduled check-ins. And then if the patient's condition deteriorates drastically, then they might need to be rushed into the emergency room or the family might you know, call the care team. So the idea is to try to facilitate more timely, personalized and targeted management of type one diabetes, where rather than waiting for either the fixed cadence of the appointment or for something bad to happen to the patient to the point the family reaches out, we wanna use data from a continuous glucose monitor to track each patient's glucose control and then identify if that glucose control deteriorates and then surface that to the care providers in a way that they can reach out to the family, perhaps with a quick asynchronous telehealth visit, like a message through my chart that says, hey, look, it looks like your after dinner glucose is getting really, really high. Perhaps you should adjust your pre-dinner insulin dose a bit. And through that kind of light touch intervention targeted to when the patient need it, potentially improve management, but avoid overburdening the care team by asking them to track every single patient, every meal of the day, every day of the week, and so on. So that's the ideal. And how we've made a first pass at doing this is a tool called Tide, where all of the patients in the clinic are presented using a variety of summary statistics of their glucose management. And those patients where there's some flag, for example, if their time in range is below a certain threshold, they appear in red, are ranked higher on the list so that the care providers can immediately visually identify and say, oh, look, patient four, they're all in blue. They seem okay. Patients one, two, and three, they seem like their time in range has really fallen. Maybe I should send them a quick note, take a quick look at their data. And what we found in this is that it's increased the time and range for the people in this program. And it's also led to improved HbA1c. This is a huge project with David Moss, Priya Prahalad, Ramesh Johari, and many other people, and Johannes Fursted. What it's done is as a proof of concept shown that Instead of just using telemedicine to replace one-for-one -one in person visits with telemedicine visits, we can use technology to try to identify when patients could benefit from intervention and also use technology to make that identification less burdensome on the care providers, make them spend less time looking at the screen. We thought we would also try to do something similar for the adult cardiology service, where significant concern was that. Yes, telemedicine is great and it's efficient, but maybe there's an opportunity to reduce the effort that goes into triaging whether a patient visit should be in person or through telemedicine. And if that effort of triaging becomes significant enough, then its costs might outweigh the benefits of the convenience of telemedicine. And the idea was that we would use a ton of historical data from adult cardiology and patient and provider information to see if we can build algorithms that can help triage whether a visit may be more appropriate in person or through telemedicine to save some of the work associated with that step. However, when we started digging into the data, even when we looked at for a specific cardiology subspecialty and a specific reason the patient was recommended and only first visits, so controlling as much as possible as we can to reduce variation associated with the patient or the visit type or anything else, we still saw that telemedicine use varied from 0% to 100% by provider in this very specific context. And in fact, when we did a more formal analysis by using logistic regression model to see how well can we predict or classify if the visit happened in person or through telemedicine, we found that the strength of the association between all of the features, 
the diagnosis, the first or return visit, the patient age, their distance from the hospital, all these things that you would think would be associated with their likelihood to come in person or telemedicine, it actually had no more explanatory power than just using the provider ID. And this is really strong statistical evidence. And we examine in many ways that inter-provider variability drives essentially all of the differences in telemedicine versus in-person visits. And so here, the tool didn't help us triage visit types, but it did diagnose the hospital with an opportunity to reduce inter-provider variation. In fact, we quantified that if the bottom one third of providers that make the least use of telemedicine would use telemedicine at the same rate as the top two thirds of providers, then through the efficiencies associated with that, the same cardiology service could see significantly more patients. And this is an example of projects where the final result isn't a tool or an algorithm to be deployed, but an opportunity to either redesign care or an opportunity to study the current processes for something that people hadn't realized needed to be studied. So now another project where the output was a tool, and again, the goal is to reduce variation. We knew that historically, the admissions to the pediatric intensive care unit varied significantly. We would have some days with eight admissions and the next day, zero admissions. And the impact on patient flow, on the staffing, as you can imagine, is suboptimal to go from eight to zero. And so what we did is built a detailed simulation of the hospital and tested a variety of algorithms until we found one that was simple enough that it could be implemented in Epic and still improved performance. Basically, when a patient comes in, the algorithm identifies those days when the patient is going to potentially be scheduled because the surgeon has enough time. If it's a three hour case, the surgeon needs at least three hours available that day. And then of those days, the algorithm identifies that day, which thus far has the fewest admissions scheduled to the PICU. So that the scheduler can try to negotiate with the patient. Hey, can we choose either July 9th or 23rd for you? Because July 2nd really isn't the great date. And with fantastic help from Matthew Randolph, and the information services team, Glenn Loving and many others. This has actually been implemented in Epic um, and the schedulers across the surgical services are using it. And we've seen the coefficient of variation in the number of admissions to the PACU reduced significantly after the tool went into practice. Another project where there was a tool actually deployed was as part of a huge institutional effort to reduce CLABSIs, the team worked with a great many stakeholders, Lane, Andy Shin, Roshni Matthew, to develop an automated dashboard to help infection control managers and nurse managers identify where the best opportunities for improving compliance with elements of the CLABSI bundle were. And after the effort began, we saw a reduction in CLABSI rates. And then after the dashboard was designed and tested, we saw this kind of maintained reduction in CLABSIs. So this is an example where the dashboard was used and people liked using it. And it makes sense that if you help people identify where they need to target improvement, that it could help but we really have no confident way to measure our impact on the CLABSI reduction versus the impact of the other interventions. So we built something useful and that people are literally using it, but we have no good way to determine how much if any of the benefit is derived from it versus other things. And then finally, this is an example where we had errors and delays associated with surgical supply lists. Something you need for surgery is missing from the surgical supply list called a preference card. Then it takes more time to get it before the case or people don't realize it's missing until the case is 
going, then somebody may have to run out of the room and go get it. And there are many, many such items and there are many, many different types of preference cards because they're all surgeon and procedure specific and things change if items are discontinued or new items become available. And typical machine learning and algorithm models aren't well suited for this kind of problem with relatively few observations and many, many variables. So we designed a novel time series regression based approach to identify items that looked like they were with a high probability wrong. The simple example of identifying a surgical preference card where some item had been used between two and three times in many of the cases, but zero of it was required on preference card is something that one of the nurse leads who used the tool could say, yeah, that looks like it's probably a mistake, let me fix it. And when we measure the impact of this using a case control for cases that were and were not revised using this tool, we saw that it led to significant cost savings and significantly more revisions of the preference cards than in um, those types of cases that weren't revised using this. So those are the examples of the different projects and the different themes. And uh, thank you for listening and take questions if you have them. All right, uh, thank you uh, so much, David. Uh, we have a couple questions um, already in the chat. Um, Amin, do you want to ask your question in person? Sure, David, thank you, for, as always, for your expertise. So um, my question, I also put it in the chat, states that so in radiology, we have uh, patients who come through the ED uh, and they're listed as trauma or non-trauma. And uh, the portion of the patients who come through the um, ED uh, listed as trauma is significantly smaller as the patients who are refer to radiology for um, different modalities like CT and X-ray. Now you talked about the uh, logistic regression model, which determines um, usually uh, it's like a comparison of two different outcomes, a yes or a no, or a pass or a fail. Um, in this case, since we have trauma and non-trauma, do you think that this model could be used uh, in radiology to determine uh, the occurrence? Because this happens on a daily basis and every day, we are determining what the priority um, is, where the resources are utilized. Those patients obviously take uh, resources and, and are listed as priority, whereas the other ones are bumped after. So do you think this uh, regression model would be uh, clever to use for this case? Thank you. Absolutely, yeah. And I think that, for example, if you have a clean data set that actually has the outcome and the input variables, then I mean, it's something I wouldn't even need to enslave a PhD student for. I would just run this analysis for you myself in a minute. But the bigger opportunity, I think, would be if this is something that you saw could really help decision-making or patient care efficiency in some way to engage and think about what are the decisions this is going to drive how are these decisions going to be made based at the cadence at which you need to make them? And what are the associated parts of the process where the efficiency could be improved or not? And potentially by exploring from this engineering point of view guided by your clinical experience, this opportunity, there may be ways to design and build something that's even more beneficial than simply this tool. And that's usually the approach we take with all of our projects. Building the machine learning model is pretty much trivial by comparison to both the challenge and the potential value of partnering with the sponsors to understand the entire system and understand what could be of most use. Great, thank you, David. Um, thank you, David. Uh, Lily had a question about Tide. Lily, do you want to ask David uh, your question? Yeah, thank you, um, David. This is really good presentation information. 
Um, so uh, we use, as you see, San Diego Health, we use Epic as our uh, EMR system. I'm just wondering, is Tide kind of interface with uh, Epic or other or Cerner? So we can, uh, it was really interesting story that uh, reduces provider screen time and you, you're building that, um, you know, the we're approaching three months uh, time before the test is due. So give our providers and team a break from manually tracking this kind of information. That was really, really good. So we actually have some diabetes and um, blood pressure uh, key indicators that uh, we're tracking and trying to make some improvement work on. I'm uh, just wondering how the technical part of the interface. Absolutely. Might yeah. So, and it's great that David Moss is on the call. He's been really the leader of a big transformation of our type one diabetes care that uh, Tide is just a technology part of. So currently Tide ingests data from Dexcom Clarity, which is the continuous glucose monitor platform our patients data is submitted to. And it is displayed through Tableau, which have an enterprise license set. Yes. So if you wanted to use Tide, all you need is a Tableau license to deploy it. And you don't even need a server license. You could deploy it locally on a laptop, although that has challenges with scaling. And a way to get your patient CGM data, which Dexcom Clarity makes easy, but there are other ways from other platforms to ingest those data. And we are totally committed to making this open source. We're actually actively developing fully open source alternatives to Tableau. So uh, please do reach out to David Moss and me, and um, we will share the preprints with you. And really we'll just give you the software and walk you through exactly how to use it for your patients. The communication with the patients, of course, still happens through Epic Cerner or whatever your method for communication yeah. with patients is, but the tool itself just requires CGM data and the computer. Fantastic. Straightforward enough. Thank you so much. I will reach out. Wonderful. David, we have a, another question from Mike Spence. Uh, I'm going to read it and then I have a, a, an additional comment because I was curious about this as well. So it says early on, some people, including myself, saw the SURF approach as a potential threat to the lean people engagement process-based approach to improvement. Now you've been doing this for a few years. How are you partnering with performance improvement to make the approaches complementary? And I would say the same thing in another way too. Uh, you know, you're obviously a mathematician and a data scientist. Um, how do you see the optimal way to bring together improvement science and advanced data analytics to optimally position us to improve? Yeah, absolutely. No, thank you for the candid question and Lane for the kind of extension of it. I think that in almost every other industry where you saw lean really succeed and which was popularized, it was always a fundamental partnership between the process improvement and the expertise providing the service or creating the value and hardcore technical engineering. It was never only one or the two of them competing. So the analogy of you know, us delivering Star Trek level care, I think really suggests that to improve it and to really harness the benefits of a lean approach to operations, we also need Star Trek level engineering. I think the BEDS project where we have now deployed an Epic to improve surgical scheduling is a fantastic example. So Matthew Randolph, a member of the PI team was of fundamental importance and value as a partner in understanding the entire context in which this would be used the challenges that the surgical schedulers currently face, the opportunities to improve scheduling, how the surgeon's current constraints and other responsibilities would have to be designed so that the model respects them appropriately. And the technical development of the tool and the reason that it ended up being this heuristic instead of a much more sophisticated mathematical optimization or something else, really came as a result of this partnership where we worked hard to understand the use case 
And that because the technical solution was developed in response to that, it was feasible to implement it, to get people to use it and to drive value, which was the result of the lean culture. So I, I fundamentally see it as a partnership. And just as our mathematical models would just go into some paper and never provide any good if we didn't have the culture of lean to implement them, lean can benefit from partnering with really advanced analytics and technology to design those interventions when they identify the opportunity. Thank you, David. Um, anybody else have any questions or comments? Please feel free to speak up or put in the chat. While we're waiting for another uh, question to come up. Yeah. Oh, do we have one? Okay, please go ahead. Hi, David. Uh, my name is Julaine Lee. I joined Stanford Children's Health this spring as a senior okay. data analyst in HR. Um, and so my question is, you know, as I'm kind of getting the overview of where all of our people data is and understanding the complexity of it, and also coming from a, a health tech startup and seeing like all the new fancy, shiny, you know, startup fun tools and stuff. I'm just curious, where is the balance between um, kind of sticking with what we have and, you know, considering adoption of new systems, which I understand is a huge undertaking to, you know, approve it and make sure it's really the right fit. And, but if those tools can give us faster and quicker data um, to help managers make better decisions and get a better pulse on employee engagement, which all those things I think kind of end up impacting patient care, where do we find the balance in that? And of course, you know, with a new system there, there's cost, there's people time to implement those things. So um, it's something that I've been thinking about and I actually have a vendor meeting tomorrow to look at their analytics dashboard that seems pretty slick and you know automated, but just kind of want your input on that. No, that's, that's a wonderful question. I think it really hits on a couple of themes I uh, brought up and want to emphasize. Um, so one is, if you look at the projects I talked about, none of them were like some incredibly fancy algorithm or artificial intelligence or machine learning, right? They were a presentation of data using Tableau, you know, a decade old tool that really we didn't even need. We could have used a much simpler dashboard in the original version. They were the project with Neil Kalan and he's on. Um, a logistic regression to identify providers as the source of variation. There was one really fancy project where we developed new algorithmic approaches to identifying errors, but that was just used offline so that our surgical leaders could identify where the errors were and update the cards. It didn't require launching anything in our infrastructure. And so that's a preface to say you probably want people to engage very, very deeply and meticulously with your managers and other decision makers on what's the decision, what's the process, and what's really the specific case where you are going to make a decision more quickly, or you are going to do something that improves patient care. And I think that because of a lack of robust technological infrastructure in hospitals, there's a lot of opportunity, but at the same time, certain things just aren't actionable. I'll, I'll give you an example. There's an entire cottage industry to developing ways to optimize nurse scheduling, reduce the number of nurses you need, create a better match for patient needs, reduce cost, improve quality, and so on. However, very few of them are designed at the lead time of like six months to a year, which is how long you need to hire a nurse, or more than a full month before you need to set the schedule, right? They're designed on like, hey, two days in advance, one day in advance, 
But really at that point, the charge nurse on the unit probably knows what the unit needs and can probably make the people that they need to call in or call off without sophisticated analytics. So it's actually similar to my uh, answer to Amin's question early on is it probably takes a ton of engagement between the people who are gonna make the decisions and the people who are providing the technical analytics to understand, well, is it a decision we can even act on more quickly? Is it something that's going to be valuable? And subjecting things to that lens probably weeds out a lot of the fancy things that people want you to buy or invest in. In fact, it also illustrates this fundamental necessity of the lean and the technology partnership to not just say, well, this technology looks so cool, but then saying, okay, but is it gonna fit into and improve the processes based on the constraints we face here? Thank you, David. Uh, other questions? Oh, wait, I'll ask you one. Um, you showed a slide, David, about the various ways that projects can go wrong. And I'm just curious, um, as you've experienced now uh, multiple years of various projects, from a, from a, particularly ones where you like come up with an algorithm to do uh, provide uh, analysis or information, what have been the biggest challenges or what have you learned as far as sustainability and the things that jump out to you uh, as red flags when probably the project is not or is going to be sustainable? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I didn't have time, but we had this fantastic example where everybody was upset that our surgical procedure durations weren't accurate enough. And we built super fancy machine learning and we could predict the procedure accuracy and we could get it right more often and to more accuracy than the surgeons would. Then we partnered with an external company to implement it to detect those inaccurately scheduled procedures and send a notification that this might change something. And it worked, the machine learning worked, the text messages worked, and it was discontinued after two months. The amount of effort required to change the schedule and try to improve the scheduling estimates just was not worth it for the marginal benefits that would be produced. And I think that uh, any project that suggests here's a simple techno, here's a fancy technological solution to a complex problem, that's my biggest red flag. I think that the engineers and analytics folks from, that are outside of healthcare have a tendency to conflate the relative simple technical tools we use. I mean, we're still sending faxes with the notion that it's a relatively simple operational environment. And that couldn't be more wrong. It's an incredibly complex interconnected operational environment. And so if the consideration that goes into developing a tool doesn't really reflect a deep, deep involvement and partnership with the care providers, with the lean PI people and others, then it's going to seem too simple and it probably will. Thank you, David. Uh, we probably, we have about five minutes. We probably have time for another question if anybody has one. Um, would anyone else like to ask a question? Hey, uh, David, uh, someone has a question as to how do you select your projects? You know, what is the process by which projects get prioritized and selected? Great. So I was hoping somebody would ask that show. Maybe they're interested in submitting a project. So, uh, so our website is surf.stanford.edu. And before I had a beautiful, uh, now 60 month old daughter right here at Packard, I used to surf, which was my, how we got the name. Now I don't do anything. I don't even sleep. But uh, the projects come in in two different ways. One is year round, if somebody has an exciting, idea and potentially funding to sponsor a PhD or master student to work on it, as well as data in hand, 
then just sending us a form from the website or emailing me directly is a great way to get in. The more formal and structured way to get a project for which you don't need any resources and don't need funding is once a year, we have a formal call for proposals. It goes out in September, October. And there's a committee of executives at Packard, Lane is on this committee, that selects those projects that seem best aligned with institutional priorities. And those projects are assigned a team of students. I teach two classes in engineering. One is a classroom class to get the students ready. And the second is a full project class where the students are entirely dedicated to the project and meeting with the sponsors. So if your project is selected through this committee, then you get a team of engineering, MBA, sometimes even medical students assigned to work with you for 10 weeks in a sprint. And then many of the students usually remain on to facilitate implementation or publication. And then if it's an appropriate type of project, then information services or process improvement or other groups will lend resources for implementation. And David, do you want to re remind people one more time what time of year uh, that happens? It's uh, in September, but if you're potentially interested, just send me an email now, and then I'll make sure to include you on the distribution list when that call for, call for proposals shows up. Okay, thank you again. Um, we have two minutes. Does anybody have any last questions they would like to ask David? All right, David, thank you so much for your presentation and for entertaining everybody's questions. Thank you so much and thank uh, all of you for attending today and for your participation. Uh, we hope to see you at the next uh, Stanford Medicine Center for Improvement lecture series. And as Lisa has put in the chat earlier, if you are not already an affiliate or fellow of the center, uh, please consider joining. Uh, thanks so much and have a great afternoon. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to present here. Thanks, everybody.